Brother Jones, you say the prayer and follow the pledge. Yes, sir. My Father, we thank you today for this good day you've given to us. We ask you to be with us today, Lord, in our discussion. Be with us, Lord, in our discernment. God, help us to make decisions that are prudent and wise, not only for today, but for tomorrow and every tomorrow that you would give unto us. We thank you for this time today, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. Approve of the minutes. So moved. Yes, sir. Got a approved motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That carries. Payment of the county bills. So moved. Second. Got a motion second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That carries. Public comments. Have any public comments? Your name for the record, please, ma'am. I'm Andrea Novak, and thank you. I'm Andrea Novak, and I've just become the first vice president of the Alligator Point St. Teresa Association, and I've also chaired the association's road protection committee. And I just want to give thanks to Commissioner Bolt and everyone, every one of the commissioners, and everyone who was involved in getting the temporary asphalt road. I live on Ball Point, so I don't have to travel that road as often, but the people that I know that live in that area are so pleased, especially that there's no dust and that there's a road that they feel safer on. I know this is just a temporary road, but we look forward to working with you in the future in a permanent solution. So I do want to thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Commissioners. Gordon, Your name Hunter. For the Gordon Hunter, District One. Yes, sir. I just want to let you know that there is a group that's been uh, forming uh, in the area. It's called Friends of the uh, Apalachicola Regional Airport, and it's a voluntary group of uh, aviators and airport enthusiasts who uh, want to volunteer to help the airport in its different events and activities. And uh, right now, we're uh, up over 40 people that have volunteered, and which is a good sign. We haven't even scratched the surface, I don't think, but. The idea is to just promote the airport, to support the fixed base operator, Centric Aviation Air, and events that they hold, and to support our, our airport manager. So uh, they had a, a, they opened up with a pancake breakfast last uh, last Saturday, and according to Centric Aviation, it was a big success, and they're going to try and do that on a quarterly basis. It brings people in from the southeast to land at the airport, see the facilities, buy fuel, and uh, have a good breakfast. Uh, they're also, uh, Centric Aviation is also tentatively planning to have an air show maybe in the fall, like in October. So uh, uh, there's a lot of good things that will help the airport very much. The idea of the group is to support aviation and also to, uh, to uh, support the youth of the, of the county. Centric Aviation has given away a couple of thousand dollar scholarships in the last, uh, couple of year, last year to uh, students and uh, I know that I've taken one of them up flying and He's uh, uh, locked on to an aviation career now, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So the group that we have is going to be just to support and volunteer. We uh, uh, also are going to try and uh, support uh, an idea that's come up about having a civil air patrol unit at the airport for the youth in the, in the county. And we've got some people that are, have been, got experience doing that, and hopefully we'll be able to get it organized. The other thing that uh, people are interested in is uh, creating a museum at the airport for the World War II, for the artifacts and, and the history of the airport from World War II on. And we've had contact, good relations with Gordon Johnston uh, Museum over in Carabell, and it looks like we're going to probably get some artifacts uh, loaned to us, and we'll create a, a museum type thing somewhere on the airport property. We're, we're still kind of looking at that. Anyway, I just want to let you know that, uh, that we have a lot of people out in the community that are interested in the airport, want to volunteer and help and make it a success. And, 
also do what they can to stimulate economic growth whenever we can as well. Um, this is not a, a group, it's a, a political group. We're, as aviators, we see things when we fly in and out of the airport that we think the airport can be improved. We're going to offer suggestions but to our airport manager and to you, the Board of Commissioners, where we can. And I think it will be a good thing for the future. We, uh, we really think that the airport's a, a great future for the Franklin County, especially as uh, the county turns more into a tourist center, people flying in and driving in. Uh, I think it's going to be a good thing. So we're, we're glad to volunteer and uh, anybody can join. There's no, no dues or information available except just to be, have a love for aviation and support the airport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, everybody remember Alan Pfeiffer, Concerned Citizens of Franklin County. Everybody remember Julia Mays. Uh, I remember once going there, I, the pie was the best. Yeah. And I saw in the freezer, you know, all these pies in, uh, in the cooler. And I said, I want, one of, I want the chocolate cream. And she says, it ain't set yet. <laughs> and I didn't know, I had no idea what she was talking about. Uh, I do know now what they were talking about. And uh, I kind of think that's the way it is with Weems hospital. Commissioner Bolt, local residents Gail Regemeyer and myself of the CCSC met with Weems CEO H.D. Cannington on May 14th to uncover facts concerning Weems' current and future financial health. We asked about the financial feasibility of building a new hospital, what it will cost taxpayers, what services will be offered, how a future Weems will compete with Sacred Heart and other medical service companies in Franklin County. We asked what the plan is if the one cent sales tax cannot cover the cost for building and outfitting a new hospital. A total of 32 financial questions were asked. We asked Mr. Cannington for a copy of Weems vision statement and income projections, balance sheet for Weems. We asked for a pro forma projections that would have been required by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, in Franklin County's application for the pending $10.2 million loan. We asked if hospital designs had been finalized and what the new facility will cost based on those projected <laughs> configurations. We asked if there will be any additional new services after the project is completed. We asked, what are the funding plans to bridge the gap from construction to an expected ramp up of revenues to cover interim losses? Also asked for was competitive analysis taking Weems competitor, competitors into account for market share purposes. We asked if Weems could realistically expect to repay the USDA note and how will Weems fund a physician recruitment plan costing hundreds of thousands of dollars in addition to construction and equipment cost. We asked if Weems design had been approved by the Agency for Healthcare Administration, ACA. The answer to all of the above questions was no, I don't know, we don't have it. We were dumbfounded by the lack of financial uh, projections, physical understanding and planning for a realistic county health care future. Last Thursday, May 30th, the hospital board met. Among the dis items discussed at the meeting was that our third C CFO in the last two years was missing in action. I checked yesterday, he was still gone. I don't know if that's changed today. No one knew where he was or when he would return. In addition, April financials were not available at last week's meeting. Later, that same May 30th hospital board meeting, the subject of new Weems construction was brought up. As you may remember, the commissioners gave Mr. Cannington uh, yet another $50,000 last December to update the cost to build a new hospital. Now, six months later, there is still no hard pricing for the construction project. Instead, there's an architect's unsigned letter guesstimating a new cost of possibly $17 million. But even this projection is not firm since the architect points out a partial list of exclusions which could indeed cost millions more. Commissioners, it is time to reevaluate and change our thinking about the idea of building a new hospital. Circumstances in the healthcare industry and laws have greatly changed. The cost of building can compete with a new hospital has significantly increased since the one cent sales tax was voted by you back in 2007. Indeed, the healthcare industry changes and increased costs are all out of your direct control. But we must accept the fact that is reality now when we develop a new path forward to bring quality health care to Franklin County. It's time to hear from your constituents and find out what they think and need today. We request you follow through on the Weems Hospital Board's recommendation to hold public workshops around the county to hear from the county community to determine the best path forward for quality health care in Franklin County. I think that that's essential, commissioners, to hear from the people. It's a different situation than in 2007. Please consider this is going to wind up being a $20 million project with a hospital that on average 
sees overnight patients less than one a day. We have been averaging anywhere from, not averaging, the numbers that are in the financials show from zero to 28 patients per month over the last year. Thank you very much for your consideration this morning. And I have given a handout for everybody so that they can have the information that was passed out at the meeting on Thursday last week. Any more public comments? <clears throat> Morning, County Commissioners. I'm Shannon Hartsfield. Um, <clears throat> we've been having some issues with some boat ramps. Not, not we know the weather, a storm tore thing up. We're not talking about those kind of issues. I brought to Ricky's attention last year the East uh, East Hole boat ramp at the fishing pier <clears throat> in the summertime. You know, you got different groups coming in constantly. Well, they want to fish right in the boat ramp. I mean, you have an area that's, that's about 30 foot for cleats and for boats to tie up to, to pull the trailers out and stuff. And then on the left hand side, there's none. But the problem is, you'll have 10 or 15 people on both sides of the boat ramp fishing. And then when you come in and try to pull in, they all, you know, they won't hardly move the rods or nothing. They just stay there and give you a dirty look. and. And it's becoming more and more of an issue. There's a one guy that he's come back from last year. He's there this year. I ain't had anything to say with him, but he actually carries a pistol and dares anybody to say anything to him. But uh, we've, you know, we've, I've called FWC a few times and see what they can do about it. And of course, it's not there. It's y'all, you know. So I was wondering if we could get some signs put there or something or stop, you know, we're fishing right in the, I mean, it's the only boat ramp in Franklin County that I know of anybody just sit there and fish is in the mouth of, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a major problem and it's becoming a bigger problem. So I just want to bring that attention to see what we can do about it. I have, I have pictures, but I've got a different phone. I've showed Ricky the pictures of people, how, how thick they'll get sometimes and it's getting worse and worse. You know, I, you know, I know the, the boat ramps, you know, this the dog damage in the area and stuff is slowly, slowly getting straightened out, but that's becoming a bigger issue. And what's so crazy is there's nobody fishing, be hardly nobody fishing on the fishing pier. They all be fishing right here trying to catch what it is. Black drums build up right there. And when you load your boat up, it boils that bottom up, and they want to fish with them black drum right there. You know, and, and I think that's what's attracting them more and more. But it's going to be a big, major issue. I mean, you constantly have to get twine out of your wheel and stuff. and Anyway, I just wanted to bring that attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any more public comments? Any more public comments? All right. We have the sheriff, Mr. A.J. <coughs> Good morning, commissioners. Hope everybody's doing well. I guess the, I had a couple of things we're going to talk about. Um, Michael, you want to, I guess, mention the first thing about the. Um, well, if you want to, you can go ahead and use traffic. Okay. I uh, had a lot of complaints across the county, and particularly Alligator Drive with traffic speeders, uh, Gulf Beach, and Lanark Village. Those are some of the problem areas. So we've decided we're going to have a zero tolerance. We're going to see if we can get some people to come into compliance because uh, for the last two and a half years we've been doing a lot of traffic and we've been probably 10 percent of the traffic stops we do if we do 500 in two months which we did the last two months about 10 percent were writing citations so i've instructed the deputies to have a zero tolerance if they're eight to ten miles over the speed limit and we're going to start writing some tickets in those areas and see if we can get people to come into compliance because i actually had a had an email I shared with Michael that came in last night from a from a very unhappy guy, which I think was not completely accurate considering we have been doing a lot of traffic over on St. George Island and giving them a lot of a lot of service. So it doesn't mean we're going to uh, reduce anything we're doing in any other areas of the county. We're just going to increase it in those areas. We're probably going to bring some people in in peak times to work traffic there. I mean, I was in Lanark on Saturday and it's a drag strip and some of these other places as well. I assigned a deputy full-time to traffic. I think he wrote 
12 or 13 tickets yesterday. So I'm sure it won't take long before word gets out. I mean, I, uh, from what I understand from a lot of people, uh, they're not really concerned about what it's going to do to tourism. I think if people understand they got to abide by the speed limit, they're still going to come here and have a good time and spend their money and know that it's a safe community to come to, that there's not going to be people driving crazy. Uh, actually, I think yesterday he caught one doing 100 miles an hour. I mean, some of this stuff, you wouldn't even believe it, uh, and I've caught them like that as well. So we got to do something, so we're going to really ratchet down on, on uh, folks that are driving excessively because, as you know, the roads are bad, and it just compounds it when they're speeding and driving erratically. And, of course, now the texting and driving law is going to come into effect July 1, so that's going to even add another issue. But uh, all the deputies are working traffic when they're not, you know, on a call or doing routine patrol. So we're, we're taking it very seriously, and we have been working it hard. So I just wanted you all to know that. And if you have any comments or any suggestions of anything else you'd like to see, you know, please let me know. Uh, I would just Chairman. say thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Mr. Uh, Bart. Um, I'd just like to encourage this zero tolerance to be a permanent policy, maintaining consistency. It just forevermore, it'll be permanent zero tolerance so that people are never confused again about the proper observation of our Franklin County laws. Yeah, no, I agree. And somebody said, well, they're going to call it a speed trap. I'm like, oh, well, then I guess they'll slow down. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But thank you. I appreciate your support in that. We'll, we'll keep you updated on what we're doing, but it's already been, been very busy. It's good. And commissioners, if I may have a couple items off my report while the sheriff is here so we can kind of hopefully discuss it. Item number one, at your March 19th meeting, the sheriff appeared before the board and presented his plan for a drug rehab center in Franklin County. The sheriff asked that you allow him to use the Bay City Work Camp for his center. Before you agreed to the sheriff's request, the board directed me to engage an architect that would come up with an estimated cost to renovate the dorms at the work camp for use as a drug rehab center. Mr. Doug Schuler, the architect, has been able to get a general contractor to visit the site a couple of times. However, in order to get an accurate renovation estimate, the contractor has requested plans. Mr. Schuler estimates that it will cost between $12,000 to $15,000 to create as-built plans. Is the board in favor of paying for the as-built plans from professional services? We have to go with as-built, which means they got to come and measure every door, measure every window, measure every door to get these as-built plans, but that's the only way we could move forward, commissioners, in, in order to determine, you know, what would be the cost to, because remember now, we're not just doing the cost to renovate it for use, we're renovating it for drug rehab, so to include some ARCA uh, mm -hmm. re requirements, I, I, I could assure you. Mm -hmm. But this is the first step, and I just needed the board to uh, approve that so I can move forward with this project. And it's, it's, it'll be as-built plans that we have forever, I guess, uh, that we can use for any other project that may come up if the sheriff decides to go somewhere else. I so move. That, that's a... Go ahead. Well, that's the whole question. Is he going to move forward? To spend twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 if he's not going to do a drug rehab out there, mm -hmm. if he has not acquired the funding to do a drug rehab out there, then we're wasting twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. So that's the that's the number one question: is is the sheriff planning to move I'm, forward? I'm still I'm just waiting on y'all and the, or really not y'all, but waiting on the uh, engineer. I mean we we had in the last month uh, two suicides, as you know, and the toxicology came back. Both of them were high concentrations of meth. And um, I actually had a guy call me from Gulf County last night. His daughter is addicted to heroin. He was looking for a place to put her. So I mean it's. I think it's critical that we get this kind of done and try to get moving to find the money to open this thing because there's a huge need for it. And, and one of the things we're noticing now is, and I don't know if y'all have noticed it, but I have, and so have the deputies, we're having a, a larger homeless population. A lot of these people are addicted. They're, I see them out at night. We stop them. Where do you live? I don't live anywhere. So this may also be a chance to help some of those folks as well that are dealing with homelessness and addiction. So um, I'm, still, I'm still willing to go there, and I think it's a great, a great location. And I don't know if I told you all this last time, but Sheriff Harrison 
has committed, if we are able to use that place, $100,000. He had a large drug seizure, and he committed to me a hundred grand to uh, help with operating expenses and stuff like that, should we use that. He doesn't want to go to East Point because it's further for folks from his county that need help, and which that's, you know, that is true, it's closer. And I think the folks from Franklin County feel better if they are able to come to a location here in the county. I've had a lot of people that come in and want help, and they're like, well, I want to stay here. Well, we don't have a place here. So. Mr. Chairman, I think that this would be a good investment to be able to have a plan for some functional use of that facility. And obviously now we have that, in my opinion, a, a bundled opportunity from another cooperative county in bringing in some outside funding. So it looks very promising. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Question. Uh, Michael, when we were first discussing this, part, part of this getting these as built plans is going to be to determine to make sure the feasibility of actually using these buildings. Yes. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, so I'll make a second to Commissioner Bolt's motion. I have a motion to second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, <clears throat> item number two. Uh, based on our, your conversation at the May 21st meeting, I explained to the sheriff that the county was not getting the normal amount of prison inmate crews to assist with the enormous grass cutting task. Sheriff Smith explained that he doesn't have enough or consistent number of trustees to commit on a regular basis. However, he is willing to take on one singular job at a time. For instance, he could have a crew to assist with sandbags at the EOC or a particular area to assist with grass cutting. He asked that we send him a list of jobs and he will try to address each one as quickly as he possibly can. I just want to make sure we're still on No, I'm totally, with that. I'm totally good with that. If we have a list, we'll try to, you know, triage it as best we can and when we're not out picking up garbage. Uh, so I think, I think we can certainly be an asset and uh, one of the things we've talked about with the state attorney's office, they haven't done it yet, was putting some people in kind of a, uh, not really a work release, but instead of charging them fines, maybe put them into a sheriff's work program. So if we did, we'd have more people. So the more people we have in the program, you know, that are doing county jail time, the more people we'll have available to go out and do the jobs that, that we need to do across county. But I'm happy to do anything we can, just like the other day, rode by the boat ramp, it was a mess, and called the crew down there, and in about 45 minutes, it was looking really good. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue to, do whatever needs to be done to make the county look good and, and save them some money. Y'all done an excellent job on the elderly care yesterday in Caravelle. Yeah, that was not that. Thank you, Commissioner. We were, just again, I rode by there and saw the place was kind of a mess and asked Miss Gale if she wanted some help and so sent the crew over there yesterday. I think they even washed the, brought the van over to the jail and washed the van. So, so we're, we're definitely, the small crew we have, which I think right now is about seven or eight, we're, we're getting our money's worth out of them. Don't even look like the same place. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, commissioners, what I'll basically do is have your department heads contact the sheriff directly with their list, and then he can determine which ones he can and cannot do. If that's yeah, the most whatever is like the the most important that needs to be done, then send it to us, and we can, like I said, triage it and Mr. try Chair, to get them done. Sir, I'd like to prioritize the sandbags for the EOC as we're now in hurricane season. Okay. So I'd like to get that done first, and then. He has to coordinate with Buster on the grass cutting and stuff like that. Actually, um, the state crews started yesterday. Okay. Good. Do it for us. We need, <laughs> we need to make sure that's done. Perfect. All right. Okay. I'm, thank I'm you for your help, Chair. Okay. Thank you all. Have a great week. Thank you. That's it. Michael. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Why is he here? Do you want to talk about the FDOT thing? No, he's. Uh, <coughs> it's. I'll, I'll bring it to his attention. And okay. I, I can send him an email. Okay. How about that? Is that okay? Please do that. Okay. Department heads, Howard neighbors. <coughs> Good morning, Commissioner. How y'all doing? Good morning. Got a couple, three items. We, we talking about the sandbags. We got you know sand dumped at all locations, so we on, we're ready to go on that. Okay. And uh, on the grass cutting, we've been cutting and I got half of my crew also we got the inmate crew and I got about four of my regular crews that's also been cutting grass weed eating picking up trash whatever it takes to try to you know make the county look good so and uh on our motor grader I got to get back up with them so maybe one day this week 
they should be bringing a new grader down here for a demonstrator for us to try out so before we buy it or before the board approves it, excuse me. And uh, on our new paint machine, I met with a guy yesterday. We did a spot there on school road mm -hmm. with a strip where the stop sign's supposed to be, which ain't the stop sign. You got the strip with a stop on it. Mm -hmm. And it worked really good. So it was less than what I thought. It was going to be about $4,000 for mm -hmm. a bunch of the strips that you paint and the, and the gun and two gas bottles. And that's the one for like crosswalks. And yes, sir. And, and, he, and it lasts four to six years. You shouldn't have to mess with them. So, yeah. Yeah. now far as long lines like yellow lines and stuff, we can't do that. But the stop bar, stop signs, uh, handicap, and different stuff like that, we can do. Sounds right. Yeah. Thank you. And we also, as of yesterday, we all the road department crew is recertified for inmates. So we had that class yesterday. So we all good on that. Anybody got anything no. for Howard? <clears throat> I do, Commissioners. Um, let's skip over to page three. My report, item nine, item ten. Uh, Mr. Howard Neighbors, the Superintendent of Public Works, stated that Ryan Drive in Caraville is, is in need of major repair. Mr. Neighbors stated that the pipe under Ryan Drive is failing and needs to be replaced, which would require a major cut on the road. The problem is that it's an expensive project, and even though there is some claim that this is a county road, it is within the Carabelle city limits. This is a similar situation to what the board recently discussed about grass cutting and road repairs within the city of Apalachicola. The board of the same thinking that Ryan Drive is, I should have said, in the city of Carabelle's responsibility or something to that effect. Usually what happens here, commissioners, is that if there is a, a, a project like this, that we have equipment that either of the two cities don't have, we usually let them pay for the pipe, and you correct me when I'm okay. overstepping, we usually uh, let them pay for the pipe material that's needed, <coughs> and then we use the county crews to help assist them with the work. <coughs> so that's the normal process of doing it, but we don't pay for the material. So I, I just need to, f to make sure how the commissioners feel about it, and I'll let Howard speak, because he knows more about the project than I do, what needs to be done. Yeah, on, on that right there, now, you, you also you got a sidewalk, which has all got to be took out, so it'd be a major job. So I don't know what you contract got out or uh, which you got paving, I think, is going to be going on here pretty soon on 67, which, but I don't know if that's in the contract, but a lot on that 67 on Tallahassee Street, and then you hit 67 and all, a lot of your pipes and stuff like that is also undermining, so I don't know if it's in the contract for some of the pipes to be replaced when, when that roads repaved or not, you're going to have the same problem. You have a good paved road in a couple of years, you know, your whole road is going to go to falling in. So. That's on 67? Yeah, yeah, Tallahassee Street from now, I think 98 to the prison, I think you're supposed to repave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lake Moratti Road. <clears throat> yeah. So. But the other spot on that Ryan Drive, now we done, that's the third time in two years we had to dig that up. And what it is, your pipes have been there probably 40 years and your pipes are separating. So basically all your roads got to be cut, all your pipes has got to be dug up, and then you got a, a cross with a sidewalk and all that. So it's going to be a pretty major job, and it's a big concrete pipe. So Did y'all ever figure out whose road it was, or the <laughs> counties, or the cities? I can't answer that. So. If, it, if it's within the city, just like 12th Street in Apalachicola, we determined at the last board meeting, if it's within the city limits, then it's a city road. When it gets outside the city limits, then the county takes over, and it's county road. I mean, you got to treat these two cities the same. Oh yeah, you can't definitely. pick and choose. I mean, if that's our, if that's the board's policy, that's the board's policy. If it's not, it's not. Yeah. But we, at the last meeting, we determined that we weren't cutting grass within the city limits, which I know Mike has cutting grass on here. Mm -hmm. That's not what we do, and that's what we told the city of Appalachia. Now, if we're going to change the policy, then we need to write them a letter and say, you know, yeah. we need to establish a policy. It's got to be good for everybody, not just one. So, you know, I just want to throw that out well, we, as we're thinking about this. Yeah, on the grass. Cut. We've always, well, we got the equipment, the machines. If, you, if it's just a regular plastic 30 foot pipe or something, a couple of hours, we can put that pipe in. I mean, is that what this is? No, no, this is a major job here. This is, you're going to have to shut the whole road off, and you're probably looking at, I don't want to say probably 90 foot, maybe 100 foot of pipe going to go across that road. Ooh, is so it part of the, pro the road <coughs> paving project that's coming up? No, not no. Ryan. No, 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 sorry. No, it's on 67, the one they're going to pave Ryan's drive to the west of it. It's over on the other side. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, 
I'm not that familiar, but I don't think so. But you know, that's the problem. The problem is, like I said, it's not one of those simple jobs where we go and we help with equipment that can be done. Yeah, there's a lot more extensive, yeah, expensive you, jobs. You're looking at a two or three day project, probably three day project, and, and big concrete pipes and stuff, bug heads, um, sidewall. It is Ryan Drive, Mr. Chair. Is Ryan Drive could that be considered a scout project? I mean, is there some way of getting some help and get, to help them get this done? That's, I'll send it to Mark. See what he says. Have him look at it. See what okay. he scout that project okay. or something. Yeah, because the way it sounds. Because it runs all way. It's caved in on one side. Me and Buster fixed it a while back. Yeah. Well, last week it caved in on the other side and undermined it under the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. With the whole pipes caving in, it's going to be. Like Buster said, about three days to shut it, it down. It's all got to be replaced, all your pipe. I mean, yeah. digging it up, just patching the, where it's separating. A couple months, probably six months or so, it's going to separate somewhere else. So, I'll, like I'll say, make a motion that we get with county staff and see if we can't get, you see if it's edible for a scout, scrap scout program scrap or something like something. that. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. We, we can get it done, we get it done right. Exactly. And, and you do it for another 50 years or longer. So. I'll make that motion. So, I got a motion and second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Aye. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Sir. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, now that that's completed, I, I do think we need to clarify with the city of Caravelle, the county's position in writing, that Bryan Drive is, in fact, a city road, not a county road. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding that the county's attempts to be helpful to them within the limits of their ownership of the road does not somehow get confused that we're claiming ownership of the road and I'll be happy to draft something up yeah. send it to Mr. Moran so he can send it on to the uh, city manager of Caravel. I'll add that to my motion. I'm in my second. Okay. okay. To reflect the attorney's comment? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that'll probably help with the um, application to FDOT actually uh, attorney Schiller when we do that. <clears throat> yeah we're going to try to get us some help but we're going to you know that's a big project. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Commissioner, item number 10, uh, the board approved uh, the concept of a new road department administrative building during last year's budget process. There's approximately $298,000 available in the road and bridge fund for the project. The plans for the building have been drawn up, and the next step in planning the project will be the composition of the bid documents. Dewberry Engineers, your engineer record, could assist with the preparation and development of the bid documents. Uh, the advertising bid tab and the bid process at the contracted hourly rate not to exceed a maximum billable amount of $2,500. Should the construction bids come in on target, the project would then be turned over for administrative administration contract award to the county staff or the county attorney to handle the contract with the low bidder. Should the bids exceed the construction funds available for the project, the county will need to wait for additional funding. Board action to approve up to $2,500 to be paid out of the road and bridge fund for the development of bid documents for the new road department administration building. So moved. Second. I have a motion to second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carries. So we just don't have to It's not the building project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody got a chance? Thank you for Howard. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Fonda Davis or Albert? Good morning. How y'all doing? All right. I'm Fonda Zouch. We really didn't have anything to report, but I at least want to report that um, we had two ball teams that won last night in advance to the state. Got one that didn't fare real well, but we do have our double A's. They won our ozone one, and they'll be going to state one. We'll be going to Sebring. I think the other one we're playing in Blunchtown. Mm -hmm. So that'll be coming oh. up in the future. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Both of those teams went undefeated in their regional tournament, didn't they? Both of them were undefeated in the That's tournament. Long yeah, they were good games. I was out yes. there. They've done good. Them little boys are good. Okay. Hmm. Other than that, they don't have anything to report. Okay, thank you, Albert. All right. <clears throat> Ms. Pam Brownell, Emergency Management. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have one action item. Uh, request, I can bring glasses. Re request the board approval to advertise an RFP for emergency planning, uh, disaster recovery, and hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, we are looking at a, they haven't given us the exact amounts, but we're looking at a, probably a substantial amount coming down from, from this disaster. <coughs> we do not have time to write the grants. 
we're working trying to get reimbursement with FEMA. Um, unless the county wants to turn all the hazard mitigation money over to Frank McComb for buyouts. Uh, we have a lot of projects on our LMS uh, that, you know, we can put forward, but we've got to have somebody write the grants, and the, we're tied up with FEMA reimbursements. Is, yes, sir. Is this the same? This is the same, yes, sir. As the last time in the yes, big sir, controversial mess? Mm-hmm. Is there a way of avoiding that big mess this go around? Uh, the only thing, uh, Smokey, is the reason most of them canceled is because when Michael added that substantial penalty to them, uh, they all canceled their contracts on us. Okay. But, and I, I mean, we have a 5% um, penalty in there. But it, the next round of storms, if we get hit this season, there's no way we, I mean, in my office, is we're spending every day doing FEMA reimbursements. I understand that. <clears throat> but I also understand that this is quite a substantial amount of money with <clears throat> no assurances that they're going to do the job. I mean, they, they want to check and they want to be the, the grant planner, but they've got to have some kind of responsibility to do their job. And if they don't do their job, I mean, what's, what's the recourse other than writing them a check? I mean, we don't get to perform like that. We have obligations and responsibilities, and I think they should too. Now, to what extent, I don't know, but there's got to be some kind of clause. There's got to be something there to, to ha have the people actually perform their job rather than just having a title and getting a check. You, you, you understand what I, that's kind of my take on that? And it, Mr. You know, to what extent that needs to be done, I don't know, but we all have a part to play is what I'm trying to say. As far as your hazard mitigation grant, normally we do that, and you stipulate that in your task. Uh, they get paid out of the direct administrative costs. That's how they're paid. They write the grant, they have to oversee the grant, see that the project's done, and then they get paid out of the direct administrative uh, grant. Uh, <clears throat> I think our, our I think ours coming with disaster recovery as to what their responsibilities, their duties, and their roles are. And there has to be something in there that makes them perform and, and take responsibility for the duties and the roles that they're supposed to perform. How we get there, I don't know, but it, there's got to be some mechanism. And, you know, you know more about it than I do. You're the EOC. In uh, the negotiations that were going back and forth between um, Schuler and some of our contracts, they did put a clause in there, uh, a professionalism clause. Uh, but for to you to ask a contractor that if a project gets uh, <clears throat> denied, that they have to pay the county back that full price of that project plus five percent on top of that, you're not going to get anybody to do that because they're just they're just putting in what we give them. There's no guarantee. When, uh, there's no guarantee that when we put it in that finger won't come back and say down the road somewhere, well, uh, you didn't do quite do this, so you're, you're ineligible, or uh, you didn't check this box, because it's up to us to make sure that the boxes are checked. All right, and it's their <coughs> responsibility to help you make sure those boxes are yes, checked. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's my point of view. They can't put everything on you when these are the professionals that we're asking <coughs> to hire, then they should be able to give you advice and make sure that we're following the steps that we steps. need to follow, because that's all they do. You know, that. There has, there has to be some mechanism where this professional group, if that's all they do is keep up with FEMA regs and FEMA requirements, that they they lead us to make sure that we put check in the right box, and, and that's my point, check in the right box and making sure we're doing everything we can do. And I know you can do everything you can do, and FEMA can twist the rule on you or whatever. I understand all that, too. <coughs> that's all these people do. You do a lot more. We do a lot more. The staff does a lot more, but this is all these people do, and, and there has to be some uh, level of expertise if we're going to hire these people, and if we're not, we might as well do it ourselves. You, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. And, and yes, that's sir. the way I feel. That's just me. That's not the Can point. we just table this then and let me get with the state and see if they can figure out in their contracts how they have some kind of penalty? I mean, I don't want to be overbearing. I just want to make sure that whoever we're hiring to do the job is prepared and, and, and 
helping us do the best they can to help us make sure that we're doing all the right things so that we get reimbursed for the money spent. And the money spent is the taxpayer dollars. It's not our dollars, it's the taxpayer's dollars. So I want, I'm pretty cautious about how I use that money and making sure we use it wisely and prudently. Uh, because it's, it's not easy to pay these taxes. It's not easy on the people of the county to pay these taxes year after year. I want to make sure we're using that money wisely. <coughs> and I'll make a motion to table it to Aunt Pam and come back to some uh, and maybe deal with the, the attorney and see what we can do about making this thing work. Because I know you need help. Well, and these people are <coughs> professionals, and this is all they do. And I expect them to give us some kind of assurance that, that we're moving forward in the right direction. And, and I know you can do all you can do, and then it's still not enough. I understand that. So there's a fine line of how we get to where we want to be. And I'll make a motion to table it until y'all can get together on it. I have a motion on the floor. I have a, a second. second. I have a motion second on the floor. All in I favor? Have a discussion. Hold okay. On. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'll ask one question just <clears throat> to clarify. Just because the way this is worded, Miss mm -hmm. Pam, are we advertising for three separate RFPs or is this one? No, it's one. Okay. The, the consultant will do all of it. Yes, sir. It, it would be according to what we passed out to okay. them. Well, and what I'm worried about right now is that money coming down from, uh, because we're first tier, uh, because we were hit. So there'll be money coming to this county that is designated to this county. Unless you got projects ready to submit, mm -hmm. then the second tier or third tier will submit their projects and that money will go to them. Right. And again, if, uh, you know, <clears throat> y'all want everything to go to um, buyouts, then all I'll do is let Frank McCain come know, which is the one that's doing the buyouts on Alligator Point, that he needs to gear up and write the grant to um, use all that funding for uh, buyouts. But I just don't want us to lose this money by not having somebody that can write that grant and get it project ready, because we're not ready. And again, there's a lot of projects in our LMS that we never really get a huge amount that I feel like this time we will get a huge amount, being that this disaster was so large. And uh, I just don't want us to lose out on it. One more question, Mr. Chair. Ms. Pam, the Tumman Grant RFPs for all this, do we currently have any of these in place? I mean, in other words, when would this be needing to be active by? Uh, well, if y'all had approved it today, we'd advertise it right. starting next week. But again, um, what are we currently without any of these? We're without okay. uh, any. That's what uh, I didn't understand. Okay. Yeah, they all canceled their contract. Okay, I thought we were just trying to come up to renew. That no, this will okay. start completely over. Okay. Mr. Hi. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, it, Pam, is this a time critical issue relative to the tiering that you've talked about? They have not dropped yet what the amount is going to be. Uh, so they just tell us that it's coming. That's the best that I've gotten. But they've also told us to go ahead and get our project shelf ready. In other words, when the date comes, unfortunately, they'll give you a date and 30 days later they want your project in. Okay. And we're adding to the LMS every day. Somebody's calling in a project and that's what it is. It's a living document. So. Uh, we add to it every day. Somebody calls in, I think this needs to be mitigated, we add it to it. And you, real quick, Mr. Chair, you also take things away from that LMS. Yes, sir. The last things, time I read it, there's certain things yeah. being deleted and certain things being added. As you see it, it's a living document, but mm -hmm. it's not all, always something being added. It's other things that are being deleted that when the project a, has been done. When the project gets finished yeah. or we look at it and say, well, <coughs> excuse me, this has been on here for so long and it's not really an LMS project, it's just something somebody thought ought to be in there. Mm -hmm. We had a, several things that weren't really LMS projects, but we had them on our list. Any more? Mr. Right, Chair. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to have the discussion as the board has directed this morning, but just to take us back in time a little bit, the board had instructed me to have a penalty provision in those contracts to have the contractors held responsible. The contractor said they couldn't or they wouldn't. FEMA said that they could if they wanted to. And so we ended up in this log jam where the contractors did not want to have a financial penalty. And so they all ended up canceling the contract. So unless there's some uh, softening in the board's instructions, to me, I feel like you know, my discretion is limited to making sure the contractor will have some financial uh, liability. So I just want that on the record. Yeah. What, what we need? 
Mr. I mean, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, let's have a discussion, Mike, between you and the, the EOC director as to how we can get to the point of having some, uh, Happy news. yeah, you know, ha having some ability to show that, you know, if it's not financial penalty, then what is it? What is it that, that if we give, if we write a grant and we give these people to the, the, the hire the consultant, what are we getting for that? I mean, uh, what, what are we actually getting for that? Well, why are we paying a consultant if we have no assurances that they're going to work their hardest and their best? But if they work the hardest and the best, we still got to pay them and we get nothing out of it. I, I don't understand how it all works. But if you put a financial penalty in there and everybody cancels the contracts and nobody wants to work, well, what's another way of doing that? Is there another way of doing that? I, I don't know. And it's not, I don't want to say here for an hour, but it's more than discussing it. I understand the need for it. We need to get the project shovel ready, so to speak. I understand all that. Uh, but that's different from disaster recovery. He, helping us get these projects shovel ready is not an issue. There is no financial penalty, I think, needed for that. When it gets to this disaster recovery and you say you need to do X, Y, and Z, and we do X, Y, and Z, which they're supposed to know what they're doing, and we do everything the consultant tells us and we can't get reimbursed, should there be a financial penalty for that? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, at this point, the board's instructions to me are to have some financial penalty if in disaster recovery the consultant fails to comply with FEMA regulations, which results in a failure to reimburse. In that instance, the way these contracts, uh, or the way the contractors want the contracts to be structured is that 100% of the profit is private and 100% of the risk is public. So, but I will meet with Ms. Pan, we'll meet with the state, and we will try to you know, come up with some alternative for the board because, I mean, the grants are necessary. I think the assistance to the department uh, for the EOC is something that is necessary, and we'll try and find a path forward. That, that's what I'm saying. Let's try to find a path forward. I mean, yeah, you were given instructions, and you follow those instructions, which you should. But, you know, as far as getting these these projects ready, that's, that's really not a financial uh, risk to the county. I mean, if we don't do it, the projects don't get done. But well, you know, just just try to find a way to make everything work. But okay. when you're doing disaster recovery and, and they're supposed to be the professionals that are supposed to lead us in the right direction, if it's their fault, if it's not, if it's famous twisted the rules around, that's not their fault. Or they do everything they can do, and we still don't get reimbursed. I don't see where that's their fault. But if you don't do what you're supposed to do and you don't follow protocol or procedure, which you're supposed to be up to date and they're the professionals, you, you know, it's not right. I mean, Mr. Chairman, opinion. if I might, that, that actually was one of the concerns of the contractors. And it, it's a legitimate concern that you have multiple layers in the FEMA bureaucracy. And their concern is, well, what if we get approval at the field level and we get approval at the intermediate level and then at the final determination, someone you know, in Washington or Seattle where they make these final decisions says, no, I don't think so. That's, that doesn't comply with FEMA regulations. Therefore, there's no reimbursement, which triggers the penalty provision, um, which I, I don't think was 100% plus five. I think it was just the, for each dollar we were disqualified, there would be a, a penalty of a dollar. Uh, so it was a one for one, not not uh, the 105%. But in any event, that was the contractor's concern and it, it is I mean it's a legitimate concern I, I agree but if they make it through level one based on a field represent uh, representative saying yeah this is good they make it through the next level yes this is good and it gets to the top level and they kick it back then I don't feel like that's their fault mm -hmm. but if they don't make level one they don't make level two you know how do you make all this stuff work you just can't sit on your duff and don't make any level and expect the county to pay you and we get no reimbursement that's so y'all work, and work that out and let's move on. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> just, sir. just one question. Michael, is, is it yes, possible sir. that this contract could be a participatory contract, that, that they make it to level one and they get a certain amount, and they make it to level two and they're paid a certain amount, but there's a holdback. They don't become fully successful. And is that legal to do that? 
we will look at that issue as well. We'll look at all the issues that we've heard from okay. the board this morning. Thank you. I got a Thank motion you, second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion carries. You have anything else, Ms. Pam? Uh, just FYI, uh, we did get the report back from, what is it, 360? Oh, uh, yeah. I am reviewing it, and then I will get with uh, Commissioner Jones so we can discuss it, and then we'll get back with the board okay. on uh, things they found, things we can improve. Uh, we are rewriting, in the process of rewriting our CMP, so we're also working on that. And uh, we will be getting with each department head to make sure that they understand that their policies and procedures that are in the CMP, if they're actually going to uh, sign off on it. We've done that in the past, had them read it and sign off on it. Anybody else got anything, Ms. Pam? I, I just want to mention something, Mr. <coughs> while she's still here. Ms. Pam, uh, first off, thank you for everything you guys do. You're I know welcome. sometimes it's a thankless job, and I know to run the EOC during a time of activation sometimes takes a lot more people than what are showing up to the party. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but going forward, and I think we'll see as we really dive into that and the board's able to discuss some of the things that come out of this report, uh, it really, I mean, we can't make it mandatory for people to fill their seat during an activation, but you can't you can't run everything on half staff either. So I just want to publicly tell you thank you for everything y'all have done, because it's not always easy. And when redundancies fail, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So I just want to thank you. We're still waiting on someone to volunteer for ESF 18. Um, that's uh, business continuity where they send messages out to the businesses. Beth has helped with us in the past, but um, she has some other obligations. She will still show up. She will still do what she can do, but she's unable to uh, be there 24-7 like she has been in the past. And, and we went to the civic, uh, to the, um, what's it called? Civic Club? No, um, John Solomon's. Uh, oh, to the chamber meeting and told people that you know we're looking for someone or two people actually to come in let us train them and actually the message they put out is the message that we put out it's the same so everybody's on the same page but we have a list of all the businesses uh, emails and we push it out that way we are still looking for you know some people to step up to the plate because that is a volunteer uh, position Anything else, Ms. Pam? I do. I do got one more thing I was thinking of, uh, <coughs> and probably direct county staff for this one, is to put a place an ad in that place called Times telling these people they need to sign up for Alert Franklin, and how do they do that? <coughs> I know we talked about it at meetings. You've been to the chamber and put it out. I'd like to put it in the newspaper so that people know how to sign up for these alerts. I think that was a big part of what happened during Hurricane Michael, a lot of people thought they were signed up or they were going to sign up, but they never did. Because my phone blew up the whole incident, mm -hmm. and I was getting all these messages. And I think everybody else needs because, I mean, that's a, a major thing there to, when you when you ain't got time to go to the EOC and the EOC ain't got time to get out in the public in the middle of a disaster, they need to be signed up for this stuff. So I'd like to make a motion that we put that in the Appalachian Cold Times to direct <laughs> and, and to inform the public how to sign up for these alerts so they come to their smartphone and they know exactly what's going on. Uh, and another issue, real quick, real quick, this ain't really the time to do it, but we are in hurricane season now. And when the county issues mandatory evacuations, you need to leave. If you don't, you after the event, you may not have no help for 72 hours at least. Trees across the road, <clears throat> that was another issue during the event was you know, nobody come to help us. Well, when we ask you to leave, you got to know for 72 hours if there's trees across the highway and all this other stuff, there ain't going to be no help. You got to be self sustained. You got to have your own food, your own water, your own gas, your own generator. If you're going to stay, you have to be prepared to stay and you have to be prepared to take care of yourself because there probably won't be no help here if power's off and trees across the road and the bridge is damaged and the roads are damaged. 
That's just the way it is. So when we issue a mandatory evacuation, and we may issue 10, and you may not really need to leave but for one, but we have to err on the side of caution as a government entity. And when we issue those orders, people need to go unless you're going to be self-sustaining and don't come back at the next meeting and say, well, I didn't leave, but nobody come to help me. Well, there ain't going to be nobody coming to help you. If you're not self-sustaining or you're elderly or you got medical issues, you need to leave when the county issues an evacuation order. If you don't, be self-sustaining. Before the event, I want to get this out to the public, and I'd appreciate if you write this up, David, so that everybody knows. And the county's going to err on the side of caution. Well, I left last time and only blew 50. Well, I'm sorry. They closed the bridges at 40. You know, I mean, we're issuing these orders based on the inf current information we have. Is the weatherman always accurate? No, which means we're not always accurate. But we're going to err on the side of caution because one of our number one jobs is to protect public health safety. So when we issue evacuation orders, I just want to put it out there. Everybody needs to go. And if nothing happens, you can come back home. But if it does, you're out of harm's way, and you, you'll be somewhere that you'll be safe, and there may be some people there to help you. But here on the coast, for 72 hours, you can figure there ain't going to be no help. So I just want to get that message out there while I'm dealing here with the EOC director today and make sure everybody's aware of that. But I will make a motion that we put in that newspaper ad of how to sign up for Alert Franklin so everybody will be informed. Second. Have a motion. I would like to add in the discussion, uh, they also need to have your reentry tags so it'd be easier to come back. We've been feeling that was outstanding. I think Jeannie said that six people came in yeah. Friday. Well, it's, all, it's an important part of the system. Yep. They're new people. I mean, people moving here. People are moving here, system. so they're coming in and getting their tags. Mm -hmm. If you amend your motion, sir, I'll, we just include both on the yeah. on I'll the amend the my motion. motion. <coughs> I'll second. All right, I have a motion second on the floor. All in favor? Uh, Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. And now, before you run away, one thing. Um, item 5 in her, if you look under her information items, item 5 talks about if you don't think her job was hard enough. Uh, Pierce, uh, Alan sent me an email, and let me go a little bit more than what Pam went there, and especially Alligator Point, pay attention here. So uh, please let the board know, this is from Alan, that FEMA has once again changed the personnel who have been assisting Pam at her office. Once again, the county was under the impression that the existing FEMA site assistant would stay with the county and assist Jennifer in completing the various damage reports through September. Here, late May, right before uh, hurricane season again, FEMA has pulled KJ, that was the, the FEMA lady, and her supervisor and replaced them with new personnel. The new personnel, which is TJ Randall and Kimberly Settles, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, promised Pam and Alan that the transition between employees would be smooth. But there's always a learning curve. Alligator Point is a perfect example of a learning curve. So here we go again. So that just made Pam's job <coughs> just a little bit harder all over again. That's it. That's all I wanted to, I wanted to expand on what you said. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Parrish for, put, for saying that. Thank you. Eric Lovestrand. Eric is in Pensacola at our seafood training. Yes. A seafood training. All right, we have a bid opening. I don't know if you want to take a break now no, because for the bid opening, I'm going to bring Mr. Cup. There you go. There he is. John up. He's going to read them because he knows exactly where the numbers right, we'll are. Give, give you five. We're going to take a five minute break and.